Okay, so I think we can we can more or less get started. Um, my name is Meka Rajagopalan. Um, I'm an international correspondent with BuzzFeed News. Um, I was the China bureau chief of uh, of BuzzFeed until 2018. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, reporting on the issues facing Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities in Xinjiang, particularly around the camps. Um, situation, and um, I feel really, really honored today to um, to be in part of this fireside chat with um, one of the foremost Uyghur journalists in the world uh, who has done so much to increase the the global public's understanding of the crisis there. Um, I have learned so much from her work over the years, and um, I'm really excited to hear what she's going to say. Um, uh, so um, welcome, uh, Gulchehra Hoja. Um, I wanted to start, if that's OK. Uh, we heard, everyone heard your, um, your speech earlier. Um, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about your, um, your career and uh, your personal history. Um, I, knew you, I know that you grew up in Urumqi, which is the, uh, the capital of the Xinjiang region. And you actually were, were a successful journalist before even leaving. Um, you worked at, um, at Xinjiang TV. And I wanted to ask a bit about how did you go from being a state media reporter and producer to then working at Radio Free Asia, which is, of course, uh, you know, banned and heavily criticized by the Chinese government. Hi, Mega. Uh, hello, dear friends. Thank you for the warm introduction, Mega. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk about Uyghur crisis and my story, too. Uh, I would like to thank all fellow journalists who tirelessly doing their jobs covering this human uh, tragedy in the Uyghur region. So my name is uh, Gulchehra Hoja. Uh, I uh, born in 1973 in Urumqi, capital of uh, Uyghur region. I start my career, as you mentioned, in uh, state TV uh, in China, Xinjiang called Xinjiang TV. It's the main <coughs> propaganda station in the region. But from my childhood, I, I am like a, a camera stage person. <laughs> I love stage. I love cameras. So I was in uh, TV programs and the commercials since my very early, you know, young age, like teenager time. So uh, in the uh, school, I was the very uh, like uh, uh, most active <laughs> kids, you know, that like to dance, uh, sing, and uh, uh, write a poem like that. So my development uh, leading me to the uh, Xinjiang TV action, uh, actually. So uh, I graduate. Uh, Xinjiang Normal University. Uh, during my uh, practice in the schools to teaching kids, and I love that job, but my ability is more than that. I feel, you know, so I was uh, asking our teacher, say, I don't want, I love teach, but not in the, only in the school. I want to do more. So I want to go to TV stations. And my teachers all supporting me. And I went to Xinjiang TV. And uh, first I go into the, uh, the Xinjiang TV, the, who's head of that, the one, one of the Chinese. Um, and the, he says, we don't have any plan to you know, to hire someone this year. And um, he just threw up my old diploma, all those things. I was so angry. And I just said, okay, I study so hard, 16 years, um, and then I get this diploma. But for you, not even take a look. So I feel, you know, so angry. I just dropped that in front of the, his desk. And he was very angry. And um, they called our uh, the university board. 
and the university called me and says, why are you doing that? Uh, you were very you know, rude to uh, them. This is not good for your career, uh, your future. And then the Xinjiang TV uh, called me and I went through there and say, why you come to us? And then I was have the opportunity to talk to them why I came to the Xinjiang TV. I would say, I love the cartoons, but even now we don't have even one Uyghur cartoon like this Uyghur language. And we don't have any Uyghur language program for the kids. I want to create it one. And then they were listening to me and uh, I just, uh, you know, was crying <laughs> when I was talking. And then after a few days, they called me and I start my work. They just give me uh, the opportunity to, uh, to whatever I was planning, I was seeing. So many of other, uh, other cameramen or the editors helping me out. And we start in 2016 in August, first uh, Uyghur children program born. So I love my job so much. And I love kids. I love work with kids. But uh, after a few years uh, in 2000, Chinese government uh, education policy toward the Uyghurs totally changed. They uh, using so-called uh, bilingual education, but it's like purely Han Chinese education and forcedly to the old school system. So we, we start seeing many, many teachers forced to give up their jobs. Many books are changing. So those stuff was bothering me a lot mm -hmm. and then during that time, I was visiting uh, Chinese uh, cities and uh, doing some uh, TV program with other uh, Han Chinese cities uh, TV station. And I saw the different, I saw the different policies. And in my mind, I was like always asking why so much difference between Uyghur region and the Chinese, you know, the, but nobody can answer those questions. On this uh, uh, time, I had the uh, opportunity to go to uh, visit the Europe. And in Europe, I first time uh, can listen and open up the internet to listen RFA's news. And then um, I changed my mind uh, after I listened all those uh, true reports about the Uyghur situation and the crisis and i feel like what i'm doing is not not the journalism it's mm. purely uh, working for the chinese government's propaganda mm. and like i feel like most one um you know in the cage one uh, bird in the cage, you know? So I, I just want to fly. I just want to speak freely uh, and write freely. And then I contact with RFA, uh, they accept me. And I start my work in 2001, mm. uh, October 15, um, until now. So uh, our work focusing um, on Uyghur uh, region, we broadcast uh, with our language. Mm. So, uh, should I continue to uh, talk about my family, or do you have any? Well, I was I was curious when you first heard RFA, like what was it about RFA's reporting that appealed to you so much? Like, what was it that made you have this change in your mind about what you wanted to do with your your life's work? Yeah, clear, it was like very clear um, uh, voice I heard from the RFA, like free East Turkestan, free Uyghurs, mm. like many of the protesters in the Germany was protest protesting. The report about that protest actually like giving me so much, you know, changes like, 
my heart was pumping, I was listening. In Uyghur region, even you cannot say East Turkestan this name right. or the freedom. You know, those words could, you know, if you say those words end up with very big problem. Yeah. And you will, you know, accuse like a separate or terrorist or something else. Yeah. So I listened all those history about the Uyghur region and the politics, uh, you know, uh, the Chinese politics toward the Uyghur region and the Uyghur people and all those human uh, rights abuses and all those stuff. What we, you know, what I produced in those years was like a happy story, mm. <laughs> like um, like a fiction movie. Ah, we are so happy. We are so glad to have this great country. Right. You know, the CCP loves us so much and we love China. Yeah. <laughs> All those stuff. I was like helping Chinese government actually brainwash our kids mm. so i feel very very deeply like guilty mm. so i start thinking how to how to fix this how to wash this and there's so many people so many kids love to sh you know see my shows and then they constantly following me mm. so but what i was doing i feel like i love them but no, I I was like just using as a, you know propaganda tool for Chinese government. Mm. So I feel very bad. I cannot describe describe my um, feelings that time. Yeah. So I I I decided to completely change what I'm doing. So. Well, it's it's remarkable what you did because you followed your conscience, but you also must have known at the time that uh, there's a lot of risk that you were taking on. Yes. And of course, um, you know, being who you are, um, it you know, it has um, it has brought about um, blowback for for your family, for many of your extended family members. And I was wondering if you could you could talk a little bit about what has happened with your family, and if you could talk also about um, how that's changed since uh, since twenty seventeen. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a very uh, educated family uh, and a very cultural. My grandpa is a great musician and a composer who is uh, who have very uh, many many uh, uh, Uyghur music and he created the first ever Uyghur Mukam ensemble in the Uyghur region. Wow. And then I grew up with my grandparents in childhood. Uh, so. I saw so many musicians, we were uh, singers, dancers with our community, um, just neighborhood. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but I just, for those who don't know in the audience, uh, Uyghur Mukam is like, um, it's a traditional style of music. music yes. um, of you just Uyghur. heard maybe uh, earlier a Europe, uh, Uyghur European uh, ensembles uh, uh, shows they're all, uh, part of the Uyghur Mukam. Mm -hmm. uh, so Uyghur Mukam music has uh, like more than a thousand years uh, history. It's a very uh, unique and uh, uh, diversities, you know, combination, very huge um, I believe art it's, book. It's, it's, it's an Music. art form that is uh, protected by UNESCO. It's international. Yes, yes. It was, I, I believe it was from 2005. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so Mukam is our life. Mukam is our voice. Mukam is love. Mm. You know, it's uh, Uyghur people love music. Mm. We are growing with music, actually. All our uh, life very connected with those uh, music mm. and mukams. We were um, sing or uh, listen music when they are sad. We were dance when they are happy. Right. 
Uyghurs uh, cannot live without those things. That's why Uyghur Muslims are a little different because uh, Uyghurs is very, very, have very long history. Mm. We, we have, uh, you know, um, have different faiths in the past. We have a different uh, kingdoms. We have different. We have used different languages, but we all keeping. We keeping them until now. The version of them. So um, we proud of that. That unique history, unique combination, made the Uyghurs so unique. You know. Absolutely. So yeah, that's why we are very different from. Chinese people and the Chinese culture, mm. very different, mm. nothing similar. You yep. can see it. Uh, it from the language, from the blood, everything. Mm. So my family uh, and my father, uh, my father is an uh, archaeologist who is studying whole life uh, Uyghur region. Wow. And uh, he has many books about uh, the Uyghur. And uh, my mother is uh, a former teacher in the uh, Xinjiang Medical University, uh, have more than 40 years experience uh, on the, um, what is this called? Pharmacy, oh. pharmacist, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. pharmacist. And uh, my father teach us how to be proud to be Uyghur, mm. how to love your country, uh, how to prepare for, you know, um, like uh, doing your best to help your people. So we are all grown up with very proud, you know, the, the background. Mm. So I was, I was in my very little young age, I, I was like always says, I'm going to be dancer. I'm going to be dancer, <laughs> you know, so I love to dance uh, until now. <laughs> so it's music uh, <clears throat> culture is very, very uh, you know, important part of our life. Um, but after my uh, work, uh, working for start, uh, since I start working for Radio Free Asia in 2001, uh, my family back home in Urumqi has been uh, harassed and uh, threatened by the Chinese government. In 2017, my only brother, younger brother, we have only two children in our family. Uh, so my brother was arrested uh, and uh, taken to one of those camps. Uh, and at that time, my mom asked me, to be quiet uh, because mm. she was so afraid. Mm. And then uh, in 2018, uh, just right after two days, uh, I uh, report about the first uh, camp survivors, Umar Bek Ali's stories. Mm. He was the first outspoken uh, the camp survivor from the Kazakhstan uh, and Chinese government, uh, you know, contact with all uh, my family and uh, uh, relatives, close relatives. Later, uh, I, I cannot, I couldn't contact with them after that. And then later uh, I would find out that all were picked up and arrested on the same night. And all these years uh, have been um, extremely difficult, mm. uh, constant worry and the fear for the loved ones back home. Mm. Um, I'm one on one hand, uh, the world is so uh, technologically advanced, connecting millions today. But we were like me unfortunately cannot even make a simple phone call to their relatives. We are all being completely cut out. Mm. So
since 2017. I was wondering if you could, um, you know, it, it's remarkable because there are so many people um, in the Uyghur diaspora that are in this position of wanting to speak out on the one hand, but then realizing that there may be consequences for their relatives back home if mm -hmm. to do so. And it's it's doubly difficult for someone like you whose job is, yes. is journalism and being in the public eye. Um, I was wondering if you could, it's a great point that you make about not being able to make a simple phone call back home, but I was wondering if you could just elaborate a bit and ex explain, like, what is it like for you to try to get information about your family back home? Um, you know, what kinds of channels are you able to use? Um, how do you, how do you actually uh, communicate with any of your family if you can at all? Actually, that's secret. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. I will share. I will share. I'm just um, uh, so uh, right. It's uh, it's difficult to contact with anyone in the Uyghur region. Hmm. Uh, why the Uyghurs cannot talk freely even there in living in the free country? Because China is exporting threat through those apps, Chinese apps like mm -hmm. TikTok, WhatsApps. So they were warning them, if you speak up, your parents or your relatives with us, remember that, you know, those kind of threat among the those uh, Uyghurs in the world, you know, mm -hmm. so all, you know, maybe most of them received this kind of message from family. They using family members phone to send those kind of threat, hmm. export this kind of threat. So um, about our work, uh, the technologies, uh, Chinese, uh, you know, jam station and those surveillance system uh, make our work harder and harder, hmm. especially from 2016 and we cannot talk to our loved ones, uh, family, but uh, some Chinese government offices, you know, the police station still open 24 hours. Mm. So we're trying to call those uh, Chinese um, government system so can uh, ask some questions, but we, like mostly dependent on some our listeners uh, sending us some evidence, you know, mm -hmm. their loved ones being arrested, all those stuff, we collecting those using uh, as a source. And many, many uh, this uh, uh, websites uh, and then the Facebook, uh, Twitter, all those who have a uh, uh, account, the Uyghurs uh, sharing uh, their personal story with us. Mm. Uh, so we earned uh, many Uyghurs trust among those years. Uh, so whoever have an opportunity, whoever uh, managed to get out from the China, they seeking help from us. Mm. They asking what they should do how they can you know be safe those uh, kind of uh, stuff after that even they they uh, share what they bring you know so all those valuable um, information we've been using yeah um i mean I've been to RFA's offices in DC myself, and um, you guys have a remarkably big staff. Um, it's made up of entirely of people who have been forced out of China and are not, you're not traveling back and forth all the time or anything like mm -hmm. that. I was curious if you could, could you talk a little bit about how do you maintain your contacts? Um, how do you convince people that it's safe to talk to you and that, um, you know, you're, you, you can be a good custodian of, of this information because RFA has done this uh, more regularly and uh, probably better than any other news organization in a consistent way. Mm -hmm. We just use the source mm. uh, they give us. We don't publicly showing their face or uh, their name. Mm. We, uh, we 
mostly uh, thinking about their safety first and asking them, can they share with us? Of, or if they don't want to, we just keep as secondhand sources like that. Mm. So for us, of course, life matter. Everybody's life matter. So we want to protect them, but sometimes they just like uh, send some videos, clip, very important. So they asking us to use, even that we have, we, we cannot decide it right away. We have meetings and uh, we um, just very carefully uh, using those stuff, but we don't know, we don't, we don't, uh, no, after we call them, after they're giving us the information, what could happen to them? This is the sad part. Every time we reporting about the Uyghur region, even we talk to Uyghurs who's working for the uh, Chinese government, of course, they're all forced to work. Mm. After we talk to them, we feel bad and we worried. Of course, we worried, mm. but we don't know what could happen to them. Yeah. Uh, so until China's Chinese government to open up the board, so let us go there and then we can find out maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to put to you related to this is a question from Alex, which I think is really good. Um, he Alex asks, can you talk about how exactly Uyghurs receive information from their families abroad and from the outside world? Uh, what devices do um, Uyghurs listen to the radio on? Um, are they expensive? Are they hard to get? Um, and we should assume that everything received by phone is spied on, which is correct. Um, and he wants to know if there's there are other technologies that um, that are being used or you think should be used um, that could help people access information inside. Yeah, RFA broadcast to the region, uh, but Chinese have as I know, have very uh, big three of uh, the jamming station around the Uyghur region. Mm. Even though some Uyghurs still can manage to listen to us in the short waves. And uh, they cannot access the internet, mm. of course. Uh, but some, some have very early, like a very um, good uh, technique with computer, all those stuff, maybe can access some of the apps hmm. in the smartphone. I see. So, uh, but they can, I, I don't think they can like freely access. It's, it's very big trouble hmm. to access any of outside of the you know, uh, China's um, websites, it's dangerous for them. Um, I'll just add um, a couple of anecdotes from my own reporting uh, to this question. Um, I'm very interested in this as well. Um, I always ask people about this. I've heard a number of answers, but I think most of the answers I've heard about this are pretty low tech. Um, like on the kind of quote unquote higher tech range, like with things like cell phones, a lot mm -hmm. of times, obviously the, the means of kind of like all of the chat apps and stuff like that are either monitored or banned. So you have WeChat, which is not banned, but heavily monitored. Um, and uh, on the other side, you have things like WhatsApp and Signal, which you can, cannot be used there, right? Um, mm -hmm. And on WeChat, a lot of people have told me <coughs> that, you know, they may not be able to have an extended conversation with their, their relative, but um, essentially what they are looking for is proof of life. So if somebody has been in a camp and they've been released, a lot of times that person will not message somebody abroad directly because that could be seen as a transgression or or proof of divided loyalties, but they'll update their kind of like story feed within WeChat with a photo or an emoji. And it shows yes. that they have access to their phone and they're alive. They're sending a message to their family to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I've heard all kinds of other things like that, but I mean, one of the stories that I've heard that really stunned me is that, um, 
you know, I met a man in Turkey who um, had more access to news about his family than most. And the reason is because he was getting um, kind of in-person visits from um, like a like a consumer goods trader that was going back and forth between Xinjiang and Turkey. And this guy just out of the mm -hmm. goodness of his heart would stop by um, his house whenever he was in Turkey and give him news about his family. Um, and mm -hmm. I thought that was really remarkable because of how low tech that that method is um, and how successful the Chinese government has been in um, sort of cutting off communications between uh, Uyghur people and, and other minorities and, um, and the outside world. Yeah. Yes. Um, as we know, uh, how hard, uh, you know, no matter how hard the situation, people, they just using their own imagination, all ability Absolutely. to reach loved one, you know. So even one picture or something uh, reminds them, you know, they just send those stuff to giving message to outside, yeah, we are okay, we are alive, or somebody passed away, you know? Yeah. They're very creative. It's amazing. They are creative. They even cannot talk freely. Even they cannot cry. Mm. But they show in different ways. Yeah. Very creative ways. So, yeah. And uh, uh, as I interview some viewers, um, uh, among diaspora, uh, some, especially the young uh, students mm. were talking to me. They said, uh, after 2018, Chinese governments uh, forcing their parents to contact them again and then saying, come back. If you not come back, they will, you know, mm. they will arrest us or something very terrible will happen mm -hmm. to our family, those kind of messages. Mm -hmm. And um, though if the old, all the kids all know if, if they go back, end up with camps, for sure. And if they don't, and their family could be, you know, taken away. So it's very hard decision to make, you know, this, this is terrible. This is, and then I don't know how to help them. Even nobody, you know. Yeah. yeah. So this decision all up to you. How how to deal with one, you know, the big country CCP. Hmm. Who, as a person, cannot. How can you fight with this, you know, cruel regime? I don't know. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask just on that note, um, I think you're in you're in a very unique position. Um, most of the journalists that are covering this do not necessarily have a personal tie to the region. Um, mm -hmm. You know, of course, like for me, I've been covering it for so long that I've become sort of emotionally involved in it. But um, it's not, of course, it's not even a fraction of what you have to go through having all of your family there and, um, and so much history as well. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, how, like how do you balance your your personal kind of um, connection to this issue with your role as a as a journalist and you know has that changed at all since the situation got so much worse since 2017? You know uh, the pressure always there. Hmm. I told you uh, since I start my work in RFA immediately my family uh, threatened by. Uh, government, Chinese government. Mm. So, but from 2017, yes, uh, the Uyghur situation, Uyghur human rights abuses become also our journalists' personal story because our loved ones also taken to the concentration camps. Mm. We all have similar stories. Uh, the, the, our office, like RFA office, we are all Uyghurs. So it's it's like very unique uh, place for us, like second family. Mm. So we can share our pain, share our love, everything together, and we we use our all ability to focus on how to help our family, help our people. You know, so we we like as me are living 
in the United States, the most free country, I enjoy the freedom. I enjoy the free speech, you know, free mind, everything. But I feel I, you know, separated my soul, you know, like part of my soul in the Uyghur region, you know. So because we focus on uh, in the work uh, about the Uyghur's uh, situation and the human rights abuses and they're experiencing all those stuff, like we are living with them. I feel like still living with Uyghur region, but physically we are very far, far away. So the I think the work helped us. Yeah, um, I totally understand that. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to just switch gears a little bit. Uh, we had a question from David. He said, are all these camps kept in the same area? Um, this makes me think that maybe it would be helpful if we just very quickly touched on some of the basics for people who aren't so familiar with this issue. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll just do a little screen share so we can have a look at a map um, and mm -hmm. talk a little bit about these camps and, and where they actually are located. Um, okay. Let's see if I can get this to work. Hang on. Okay. Um, okay. I think it's working. Um, let's see here. Oh, Are you talking about the, the news report about three AD camps? Yep. Recently find out. Yeah, the image and the maps, I, I see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, so we did a report um, a, a couple of weeks ago where we documented, um, basically this is more than 260 camps, if you can see this, that um, mm -hmm. have been built since, um, since 2017. So this okay. is essentially in three years, all of these places have been built. Um, I'll scroll up and show you sort of what it looks like. So this is an example of one of these camps. And this is mm -hmm. an image from March 26, 2019. And you can mm -hmm. see that it gets, it's getting built up and built up and built up. Um, yeah. It's in a, a county called Shufu County. And, Shufu. Um, and the significant- In Kashgar. Mm -hmm. In Kashgar, that's right. Just south of Kashgar um, in Southern Xinjiang. And um, the, the significance of this, um, is that the government in December of last year, um, they the the governor of Xinjiang, who's the second most powerful official in the region, he came to a press conference and said, um, you know, these camps are for vocational training, which is something they've said before, all along. And he said, mm -hmm. the vocational training is over and everyone has graduated, right? So does, doesn't that strongly imply that these camps are being shut down? Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of people thought, you know, maybe there's a kernel of truth in this. Maybe they are rolling back this program because of so much international criticism. But what we and other researchers have found is that, in fact, the opposite is true. We found, just like that camp in Shufu, we found that construction on these camps is ongoing even today. And um, I worked on that project with a licensed architect named Allison Killing, and um, Allison was able to analyze a lot of these um, these compounds. And um, she found that there are at least a few that can house more than 10,000 people each. And we found at least one that can house more than 30,000 people. So to me, it was it was really, really stunning. Like when she told me about this analysis, like I had to sit down, it was it was really shocking. Um, what Gould just mentioned is uh, there was a, a report that has just come out this week from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Um, they, uh, Nathan Brucer, who's a researcher there, also advised us on our project and their findings. They, they found more than 300 camps, but they essentially their findings are are very similar to us. The numbers are a little bit different yes. because they they counted uh, some substructures within these compounds as separate camps, and we did not do that. We just had a different kind of methodology. Mm -hmm. But essentially, th these two research projects. Uh, uh, like mirror each other um, kind of in a close way. Um, Gul, I wanted to ask you also about, um, you know, over your your years covering this, how, just speaking specifically about this, this camp system, how has your understanding of, uh, you know, how many people are held in there um, and what happens within the camps, like how has this changed since you started covering this in, in 2017? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I want to, 
a special thanks to you. You are oh <laughs> you did the greatest job on that. So thank you very it, much. It shows very clearly those pictures, this map and all satellite pictures. Yeah, we we can clearly you know identify those are the same construction. Mm. Um, so you remember first uh, the accusation about the Chinese concentration camp, and the Chinese uh, reaction is no, no, no. We don't have any mm. re-education camp. That's like a vocational training center to to help people to find a job or something else. And the second. They said, yes, we have uh, training centers, like um, training many, many young people who's jobless. Mm. And they inviting some, you know, uh, allies to come to the China to visit. And, and after uh, the strong accusations because of the, those camp survivors, uh, giving the detailing information about the camps, all those uh, great news reports. Also, you are doing many, many journals was publishing about the Uyghur situation and the reality of those camps. Then Chinese government says, yeah, 99% of uh, the re-education uh, students all graduate, hmm. but we can clearly see the, those camps also near to the Chinese uh, factories, all those industrial parks, mm -hmm. you know, you can see uh, those uh, industrial parks or Chinese invests, uh, uh, the, the companies all built after 2016, like same time with camp mm -hmm. was start building. So right now, uh, the forced labor issue raised up, you know. Yeah. So Chinese government is shifting their policy, but we didn't see all the Uyghurs free. If they're free, why we cannot talk to them? Why we cannot see them? Hmm. Why no, nobody can contact their family? Where are they? And the, why those kids in many, many you know, as your report, like half of million Uyghur children ripped off from their families mm. and send, forcibly sending to those, you know, orphanage houses, mm. leaving, we don't know what kind of condition there. And so the development of uh, this construction, construction um, when they rising, the all you know, mosques, uh, in the old Uyghur um, historic uh, places, all demolished. Mm. At the same time, the camps, all those new buildings for Chinese immigrants shows. So the policy is very huge and the, the ultimate goal already there. Mm. So they didn't change that, I think. Yeah, um, I, I definitely want to get back to the subject of children and also of the specific experience of women mm -hmm. um, in, in these camps and in the region as well. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but before that, we have actually a question about forced labor, uh, which you've also talked about. Um, and it, it's, um, it relates to something that you've worked on specifically. Um, so Celine says, we've seen reports pointing to specific fashion brands that have used Uyghur fo forced labor in their supply chain. And that is very helpful because now we know which brands to boycott. But in your speech this morning, you mentioned wigs. How can we detect when a wig is from the hair of Uyghurs in camps? Yeah. Um, when I was, uh, when I was uh, interview uh, Uyghur uh, camp survivors, Mihri Gül Tursun, who was uh, testified in the Congress 2018, November. Uh, she mentioned in the interview, says, right after uh, she went to the camp, they forcedly shaved her hair. Mm. And, but she didn't see what uh, 
you know, who's taking that and what happened after. And then she says, old woman, no hair in the camps. Mm. And then it was like shocked. Uh, it's, it's very humiliated, you know. Mm. So uh, after second and third, fourth, fifth, all the survivors, I asked the same question. After you locked in the camp, did they shave or cut your hair? Mm -hmm. The answer was the same. They all shaved uh, forcedly. And then I was like thinking, wow, so many hairs. You know, if you don't know the Uyghur's culture, maybe you don't have that question. But in Uyghur, the hair for women is the symbol of beauty, symbol of, you know, the woman hmm. and, and dignity. We don't cut our hair, our parents, our uh, the grandma, we saw our uh, mothers with long hair whole life, you know. So the cutting hair is forbidden even in the Islam. Hmm. So, and, and I was thinking, wow, we, we are talking about millions of people in the camp. So all those women's hair shaved, and I don't think they're going to trash them. You know, because it's very healthy, very beautiful hair. Mm. In the China, maybe only Uyghurs and some other Turkic uh, minority have brown hair, dark brown or, or light brown hair, wavy hair. We are our hair very different from Chinese and and our hair like more close to the European people. So and I was searching internet uh, the weeks or uh, like hair in Xinjiang and so many hair company pops up, you know, in the hotel. And I will think, wow, why <clears throat> we don't cut our hair and how mm -hmm. they got those sources, you know, why they building so many, the factory to making wigs, you know, and then I search, I find out so many Chinese companies moved in the same industrial park in Hotan, Lop. Um, and all of them making uh, hair uh, products with human hair. Mm. And then they said they giving job opportunity to the local people. Yeah. You know? So the, they're including the forced labor and the including the, the hair itself. Source comes from the camp. I believe that. And I start searching like four months of investigation we finally got uh some results and then we uh we published the news amazing uh, yeah and then i even uh, talked to some businessmen who are doing hair business uh, with china and hindustan pakistan and uh, they also giving us very very valuable information about inside the those factories using Uyghur women like mm. more than 16, 18 hours working there mm. and uh, like a little salary, like 300 yuan or something. It's it's like purely forced labor. Mm. And then more scary is they using those people maybe who already that mm. culture to that in the camp. You know, it's scary. It's like terrible feeling when I was writing this news. I was writing with my tears, actually. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I would just add to that. Um, I have done nearly as much reporting on this issue around hair as you have, but I too have found almost the same thing um, when I was interviewing people for, for women, for um, former detainees, for my most recent work. Um, all of the women, I think almost every single one who ranged in age from like 20s to even late 50s or 60s, they all talked about this experience of having their hair hacked off like here. Mm -hmm. These were mostly Kazakh women as well, but yeah. they share this kind of cultural um, trait of really valuing long hair and seeing long hair as a symbol of femininity. Um, yeah. I interviewed a woman um, who who 
she she described it like she you know they were they were there one day and someone said you're gonna get your hair cut today and she thought oh my gosh they have like you know they have a barber or something and then it was just somebody who came in and they just they just hacked it off like this mm -hmm. and at the time i was thinking you know why would they do this it's it's so strange um and it was only when i started to see all of these reports come out about hair extensions and wigs that i started putting it together like this might be stolen hair and it's exactly as you say like people in the region they women they grow their hair very very long and in the hair industry um the hair that is most prized is what they call virgin hair which is essentially mm -hmm. hair that is not has never been bleached has never been permed all of this stuff and um a lot of young women who grew up in the country Side, they're not really in the habit of dyeing their hair and stuff mm. like that. Um, so people, so this hair, it, it makes sense to me that it would be very valued. And the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, we all know by now that really terrible stuff happens inside these camps. You know, mm -hmm. people are subject to beatings, to abuse, uh, solitary confinement, starvation, all of these things are happening. Mm -hmm. And when I was doing interviews, I fully expected people to talk about those abuses and the trauma it inflicted. And uh, what, one of the things that surprised me is that when you talk to women, they don't always talk about the physical abuse. And in fact, something that lasts even longer is this kind of emotional trauma of having their personhood forcibly stripped from them. And I think for a woman, just losing your hair by force, a hair like your hair is one of the most personal things about you is, is just incredibly traumatic. And, um, you know, I talked to, to women who, who were crying as they were just talking about losing their hair. And you think mm -hmm. it's not so Something that your body, your whole life, you know. Exactly. It's and yeah, it, exactly. You know? it, take, it takes mm -hmm. decades to grow, grow hair that long. And yes, it grows back. But in the end, when you look at yourself in the mirror, you always have this feeling of having lost that. And so it, it really surprised me. So I, I really value the reporting that you've done on that. Um, I, Sad story, but must, you know, we have to find out, you know. Yeah. Um, there's, we yeah. have a lot of questions now, so I'll. I'll you, you were mentioning the forced labor, yeah. Yeah, forced let's labor. I want to talk about this. You know, do. Forced, do. the forced labor is not a new issue. Mm. Uh, as I remember, Chinese government established uh, employee one from every one family policy in 2004. Mm. They said every year. They are going to um, relocate one million uh, young uh, people to the inland China or the factories, and it was forcedly. You know, they were like commercial. Uh, they were calling like a must be. They have conditions. Says eighteen years to twenty five years, non married. Hmm and beautiful. <laughs> what is this for? <laughs> you know? Yeah. It was like a big question. And it was forcedly. Mm. And like since early 2000, millions of were relocated to the far provinces of China under the um, guise of the empl uh, employment. But they were subjected to the forced labor and other abuses as well. And maybe you remember in, uh, for example, in Shandong, uh, no, no, Guangdong, Shaoguan, mm -hmm. in 2009, uh, June, June 26, I think, June 26, there's a very big incident uh, in the toy factories. So many Uyghurs, Uyghur workers were abused and uh, killed by China's maps there. And then after, uh, the, in Urumqi and other cities, those Uyghurs were, uh, you know, crying for justice, you know. That's the Urumqi riot in 2009, uh, July 5th, right? And then um, Chinese government punished all of them. And it's it's like, like bloody crackdown after mm. that. And we lost Ten months of uh, <clears throat> uh, contact with our family that time. Also, ten months we couldn't call, couldn't know what happened to them. They completely shut down the computer, 
shut down the internet and the phone calls from the outside mm. in 2009. And so like the nightmare is repeating again and again. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a bit about, um, when we talk about forced labor, mm -hmm. the question that I always get is, you know, if you're in the US or Europe, what choices can consumers make to um, ensure that they're not supporting uh, forced labor? Like what, what kind of messages should consumers be sending companies um, that whose supply chains are housed partially in, in Xinjiang? You know, as a journalist, I cannot recommend a specific action or something, but uh, the, as um, the researcher Adrian Zen say, uh, the scale of the, you know, forced labor is a very huge, like, you know, even every Chinese company have, you know, used um, Uyghur women, maybe. The recent report says Chinese government uh, re-educate more than 8 million people. Mm. Can you imagine 8 million? Mm. We were talking about one to three million, but right, right. now it's eight million. We don't know how many of them from them, you know, are being a forced, you know, being a subject to the forced uh, labor. Hmm. I think what you're talking about is really important, and mm -hmm. that's that's something Adrian Zenz, uh, who's a, a researcher. Um, has talked about as well, which is that the fundamental problem here is that the supply chain is really opaque, right? There's no way for these companies to go into these factories and say, okay, there's no forced labor here because that's just not how access works in the region. So mm -hmm. the point that he's making is if you have, if you're working with suppliers in the region, it's very, very hard to tell that your supply chain is free of forced labor. <laughs> so yeah. the, the safer agree. thing would be to assume that it, it, it would be compromised. Um, just just look at the source of cotton, you know, all the, those closing cotton uh, industry, uh, like we use cotton, 80% comes from uh, the, the Chinese using the factories correct. using cotton is comes from 80% comes from the Xinjiang mm -hmm. or the region. Mm -hmm. And all those how to produce those cotton and all you know, those places are uh, controlled by Chinese government in the Bing plan, and they're using forced labor for a long, long time. Yeah. That's why, so you cannot say, even it didn't made by the Uyghur's hand, mm. this product, but it includes those cottons, bloody cottons. Mm. So the decision is yours. Are you comfortable? Are you beautiful? When you wear that. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to ask that, you know. Yeah. Um, we touched on it a little bit, but um, I was wondering if you could speak more to the experience of women and families, um, you know, both inside uh, the internment camps and then also just outside. How has this affected them specifically? Um, and can you talk a bit about um, your work on that subject? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was, it was not enough that uh, China's uh, strict birth control uh, politics put uh, anonymous uh, pressure on Uyghur women. Many of them were uh, punished uh, severely for having an extra child and were subjected to the forced sterilization. Mm. Uh, we we recently uh, saw the Andrian Zan's report. I don't want to go to the specific numbers. So, and right now, many Uyghur girls are being forced to marry uh, Han Chinese men. Mm. And uh, one of the most uh, horrific actions against Uyghur women is their forced separation from their kids. You know, mm. uh, maybe you take into the camp or you forced to working in the manufacture, the Chinese government ripped those kids from their mother. Mm. 
The physical trauma is nothing uh, compared to the physical trauma hmm. uh, intentionally inflicted on the mothers who have no idea hmm. where their children are and uh, where they are given to the others uh, as orphans or even alive. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, the Andrian, you know, um, the Andrians and said uh, and the warned China's goal, it seems, it to uh, eradicate the future generations of mm -hmm. the Uyghurs by uh, meticulously and uh, ruthlessly controlling Uyghur productions. You know, yeah. Reproductions. Absolutely. Um, I mean, for me personally, um, I think some of the reports about forced sterilization and forced birth control have been just the most shocking. Uh, mm -hmm. When I started to hear these stories, I couldn't believe it myself. But um, of course, the broader context for this is that China is famously a government that um, has a long history of controlling uh, female reproduction, mm -hmm. um, you know, through the one child policy and other many other related measures. Um, another thing that I found just through interviewing um, when it comes to birth control and sterilization is that um, you know, a lot of the women who are forced to go through these processes may not even understand what, mm -hmm. what is happening. Yeah, and then uh, like um, I interviewed a woman who, um, she was from a village, she was from a farming family, she didn't have a high school degree. She she wasn't really super familiar with, with birth, birth control. And, um, you know, she we had this interview where um, she was trying to explain what had happened to her, and it was it was so difficult because she didn't have the vocabulary to really explain yes. it. Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. um, I eventually we went back and forth, and she it it turned out that she had had an IUD put in inside her, and um, she didn't know what it was. She she thought that maybe she could be infertile for the rest of her life. Um, you know, she she went through so much time with without knowledge of of anything that had happened to her um and you know honestly like in, in some cases it's true of men as well and not not necessarily birth control but people go into these camps and they find there's sometimes there's a, there'll be a clinic and these compounds or they'll be bused to an outside clinic and they'll find that they're given these injections and immediately they'll think you know my god this is poison you know this is something that is going to be really harmful to me um it, it may be something that's harmful it may simply be an antibiotic because they don't want, uh, you know, they may not want flu to spread in these facilities. But, um, you know, what, what really struck me about it is that, you know, the just the absolute terror of being brought to a place, yes. you don't know what the reason is, and then you're given drugs or medicine that um, you can't describe, and there's no, there's no yes. way to get it independent. I, I want to talk about that, too. Yeah, yeah. Please, uh, yeah please do. Yeah. 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 Um, I was interviewed the specific... Uh, you know, uh, the topic, uh, sterilization. I was talking to more than 30 Uyghur women in Turkey and other countries. Uh, it seems, uh, as you said, most of them doesn't know what happened to them after putting this IUDs. Mm. And I, I talked to one uh, doctor in Turkey. She has 15 years experience. And she even says, because of the policy, if that child is like is not legal, yeah, says um, like more than you cannot have more than two kids if you're uh, living in city. So they kill baby even. And the one we were um, midwives, she talked to me. She says the birth control and IUD for sleep, putting IUD to Uyghur women in you know, begin 10 years ago. Mm. She says she diagnosed uh, like more than 200 women in only in Turkey. Mm. Um, she was living in Turkey from 2014. She says, uh, I see so many Uyghur women have many other like issue related with the sterilization or those uh, IUD issues. Mm. And she says the IUD she saw is very different from what Turkey uh, medical system using. Mm. 
Hmm. IUD can make you sick and then irritation, irritating, very, very like, like it was like severe, you know, problem hmm. caused by just putting this IUD, hmm. and we call that killer IUD. You know, oh, wow. T and a T that has uh, metal on it, hmm. and. Some of the Uyghur women even doesn't know they already been sterilization. You mm. know, the forcedly and after you have second child or first child, the Chinese uh, government systematically they they using those uh, you know policy to make uh, the system the the medical system do those allowed to do this. Uh, in operation, even even they don't give any information about those women. So soul, your soul, your body, your family, all dependent on Chinese policies. Yeah, so, and, if they, and if they give information, would you really believe it? You know, you yeah. probably wouldn't, right? And another, the, how about men? How about others? Today, uh, we all know uh, Chinese government giving some kind of medicine in the among those camps, uh, even men, mm. not only women, their menstrual circle will be stopped after drinking those kind of medicine. Wow. And even men getting sick. But until now, we don't know what kind of medicines they've been given, you mm. know, in yep. the camp. What is it? We have to find out so many things, you know. Yeah. We're talking about millions of people. What company produce those medication, you know, those drugs? What is it? Yeah. Who provide that? Why? So all those questions we need to answer. Hmm. While we're on the subject of health, we, we actually have a question about this from Elle. Um, mm -hmm. She says, how, if at all, have camps dealt with the COVID-19 pandemic? We've seen other repressive governments keep political prisoners detained, perhaps hoping that the pandemic will take its toll on them. How mm -hmm. has the CCP responded in Xinjiang? As like many of our questions mm -hmm. didn't get answered, this is also not answered. Yeah. So the the place is you cannot you living in the free country you cannot imagine what kind of condition is that. Mm. It's like the most high technology using for control this region, mm. and they have you know police all those governments all main goal is keep secret. You know, so it's it's impossible to ah. to ask international community to have access to the region to find out. Yeah. yeah. That's a that's a great point. I've I've been wondering about the answer to this question myself and I, I wish I could give a better one, but um, I would have to it's say the same. Worries. It, um, the, after the COVID nineteen, uh, the put this situation is another level, you know. Yeah. So we all don't don't know in that condition, hmm. you know, in the the camps, what could happen if uh, the the COVID nineteen separate in the, those camps? We don't know. We can. I don't want to imagine. You know, yeah. it's it's hard for me and the other Uyghurs because our family in there. Mm, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I would just add to this that um, as in pri all, all prisons and refugee camps and other places, social distance is not possible in these camps. Mm -hmm. It is not possible. Um, you know, one of the features of these camps that we have heard about as journalists over and over and over again is the overcrowding. You know, mm -hmm. I talked to people who described having to sleep two to a bed, having to sleep in shifts. Um, you have to understand that this these policies um, to detain 
Uyghurs and Kazakhs and other ethnic minorities en masse were adopted very, very quickly. And a lot of the people that I've interviewed personally who were detained in 2017 and 2018, the first couple of years of this campaign, they talked about being detained in the middle of the night, um, you know, very, very quickly, they would show up at the gates of these camps and there would be a huge crush of people, just hundreds of people. And this would happen every single day. And a lot of these earlier camps that we found are actually um, not purpose-built facilities, but for were sort of retrofitted, uh, you know, high schools and old folks yes. homes and other government <clears throat> buildings. And these buildings, are not, they're not meant to house this many people. They are not meant to be prisons, right? So um, it, it resulted in this situation of overcrowding. Um, and this is why a lot of former detainees, they talk about being moved from camp to camp to camp um, to sort of combat the situation. So yeah. I have not been able to interview anyone who has come out of these places after the pandemic has started. But I can only imagine that the presence of this pandemic has exacerbated what is already an extremely difficult situation uh, for detainees there. And I would just add that, you know, of all of the detainees that I've interviewed, just for me personally, I don't think I've talked to any that haven't come out with some real health problems. Um, and that is a consequence of, you know, just bad nutrition, uh, cold, uh, you know, being held in, you know, some stress positions sometimes, um, you know, a lot of older detainees, they really struggle with the conditions in these camps. They don't, they're, they're not able to sit still and, and stand for long periods of time as is required um, by these systems. Um, you know, it, it is exhausting for people. And a lot of people who go in with pre-existing health conditions then find that they're, they you know, really, really uh, exactly exacerbated in a really serious way. Um, so I think my, well, at least for me, my, my heart definitely goes out to people who are dealing with these circumstances, um, you know, amid this global health crisis. Um, I wanted to also put another question that um, from an HRF staff, um, I, I'm curious, school, what you think about this as um, as someone who's working in the U.S. as well. Um, they say, I'm curious as to how Western Islamophobia that is adopted by the Chinese government as an excuse to crack down on Uyghurs, who are often labeled as terrorists, complicates international efforts to deal with this humanitarian crisis. So basically, you know, is Western Islamophobia making it more difficult for us to respond to this? How can I um, describe this policy, how Chinese turn to, you know, crack down Uyghurs on this subject? Hmm. I told you, our culture, our Islamic uh, views is very different. We never had experience of those, you know, violence before. Hmm. It's... There is not like a religion issue. It's not like, you know, uh, ethnic issue or others. It's politics. You know, it's Chinese government uh, using this term, you know, uh, the terrorist ter term mm. from 2001. And they accusing some kind of groups in uh, with uh, links with al qaeda but we never find out those <laughs> never exist and then today they accusing all those Uyghurs are terrorists or something they have mental you know issue if they have faith mm. so if you don't obey to china right now chinese com communist party and you have extremes idea that means not only the Muslim people. If you have other faith than Chinese Communist Party, then you are extremists, you are terrorists. Mm. So how can you, can you say all those 8 million people are affected by extremist idea? This is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think... Um, I think I always tend to frame this as a, a question of collective punishment. Yes. Um, you know, for the 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 Chinese government, by its kind of own accounting, 
has punished all of the individuals that were found to be responsible for past violent incidents in um, you know, terrorist attacks in um, you know, either within the Xinjiang region or um, elsewhere in China as well, um, that they say that Uyghur separatists are responsible for. Um, I know this because I, I was I lived in China at the time and I, I covered it. Um, and you know, I think what's new here is this framing of very kind of ordinary practices, religious practices by Muslims as um, you know, an indication of extremist thought. Things like covering your hair with a hijab or growing a beard. Um, I think that's something that I think has been quite quite a shift. Um I wanted to ask this. This is the what Chinese doing is uh, already said in the many report. It's like war, like open war to the faith, Mm. not only the Islam. Mm. All the faith. Chinese government government hate people who have faith because Mm. if you have faith, if you believe true, if you believe something about the government mm. and they feel insecure that's right. why right. They, against you have faith yeah mm-hmm. um on the subject of faith and of culture um i know you have children right yes i wanted to ask um you know i i've talked to so many people in the diaspora about this issue of preserving this culture and this faith that is under threat. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what your hopes are kind of the next generation, um, you know, both within the country and then also in the diaspora. Is there any path to preserving um, the cultural traditions and faith that, um, you know, that are so valuable? Yeah, as I am part of the Uyghurs, We are simply fight for the existence, you know. We are struggling with the existence. The faith, the Islam is only part of our Uyghur culture, Uyghur identity. Mm. Part of. But it's not all. Mm. It's not all about it. So we also needs to hold our language strongly. We also have to hold our religion, our identity, our culture, everything about Uyghur, because Chinese government attacking from everywhere. Hmm. Yeah. That's why we are all struggle. Even you're in the Uyghur region, you cannot practice your belief you cannot speak your language. You cannot teach your kids in the school your your mm. history, all your uh, culture. They force to, you know, you know, reeducate. Mm. They think reeducate can change people to Han Chinese. Maybe mm. it's not possible. It's impossible. Yeah. My worry is if not, what is the solution? you know, Chinese government could take. They were thinking this re-education system, this policy, this harsh policies towards to Uyghurs could change them. Mm. Could the proud being a Chinese, mm. it's not. So I'm worried, so what could happen, you know, if if they realize they are not going to change because this policy was starting when they occupied the region mm. slowly, you know, systematically, but didn't work that much like as their wish. That's why we saw today's this tragedy happening. So the, I'm worried about the ultimate goal, you know, Hmm. Is that is this the final solution hmm. for the Chinese government? So we all we were right now focusing about how to keep our life, you know, more strongly to 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 teach our kids to keep our culture, keep 
teaching them, even uh, among the diaspora, mm. they were building many like weekend schools, Uyghur language schools to teach our kids. Mm. They were publishing books um, and they're doing a tremendous works for, you know, to document uh, all our histories or those stuff we are slowly losing in Uyghur region. Mm. So many books, so many uh, his historical, you know, uh, places, all uh, damaged, all, you know, washed up. So what can we do? How can we teach our kids to be Uyghur, you know, to keep their identity alive? It's a big challenge. Mm. Uh, even we are outside of the Uyghur region, we also you know, facing very, very big challenge. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, I want to just make sure we get to the last one that's been asked um, by Alex. Um, he said, do many Uyghurs escape or defect by foot into Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Kashmir, etc., or are all the borders tightly militarized? Um, I can talk about this, or I, I'm I'm curious if you if you've ever looked at this issue. As I know, we only have contact with some Uyghurs in Kazakhstan and, and some Kazakhs, who, you know, uh, managed to uh, run out from China, but I I didn't hear anybody from Mongolia or yeah. So I'll just give my opinion on this. So this is a complex question. Um, I think, so the first thing you have to understand, um, Gul, I know you already know this, but for, for those listening, um, the Chinese government has taken passports for all the ethnic minorities in the region. So that includes Uyghurs. It also includes Kazakhs. Yeah, from 2016. Mm -hmm. Correct. So prior to that, people were escaping, actually, um, but like actually in, in larger in quantities way. than yeah. happened previously. So that shut down in 2016 with this policy measure. So now it's extremely difficult to get a passport. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean that nobody's getting them. There are stories of people that are they're, they're paying like huge bribes and sort of things like that. They're taking yes. extraordinary measures to be able to get these passports and to leave. As far as border crossings, I know of cases where this has happened, but to my knowledge, it's not happening on a large scale, precisely because these borders are very uh, tightly controlled. Not just that the borders are militarized, but actually that Chinese security agents are sometimes active it, even within some of these. Yeah. And, and they all part of the Shanghai Six, you know. Mm. That, uh, that's another great point. Mm -hmm, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so they're all allies with uh, China. So. Yeah. They were not accept political, you know, asylee or giving them any reason to just um, keeping them in there, you know, safe. They they will just return them. Yeah, it's, it's not, you know, it's not like you cross the border, you are free. No, it's like um, no yeah. way to run away that situation. I will say there's one exception that I know of to this, at least one, I should say, uh, which is that the Kazakh government has a specific policy of resettlement for people of Kazakh heritage mm -hmm. and ethnicity. And this has enabled a certain group of Kazakhs from the region to resettle there. Right. Most of these people already have strong ties to Kazakhstan. So for instance, they have a spouse there, they may have a child or a parent there, they may already hold a Kazakh green card, they may have a Kazakh passport as well as a Chinese passport. So this is not like an option that is open to the overwhelming majority of people, but it is open to some people. And they're not safe there. Yeah. Sorry, would you say that again? Even though they, they run to the Kazakhstan, even their Kazakh uh, minorities, you know. So, mm -hmm. you remember the recent uh, camp teacher asylum, uh, seeking asylum from the mm -hmm. Switzerland, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She, uh, her name is... Um, Saragul? Saragul. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, she is the good example, you know. Even she's Kazakh. She mm -hmm. couldn't stay in the Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. so, she 
you know, seeking help from other countries. Yeah. So also Kazakhs facing those kind of challenge. It's a difficult thing because if you are a refugee, um, by definition, you're not in a secure position. So mm -hmm. if you are not in a secure position in the second country, you are not going to be going around and speaking to journalists and being public and stuff like that. It's this very, very hard situation that these people are in. And as a consequence of that, it's it's hard to know, you know, the real numbers if, if there are any, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess just I want to wrap this up on a it's I it's hard to say that we should wrap it up on a positive note because there's not a lot of uh, positive things to say. But I, I do want to talk a bit um, just to close about um, the the policy response. Um, you know, you live in D.C. and I know you are plugged into a lot of these conversations in your work as a reporter as well. I was wondering if you could talk about how the policy response has shifted in the last two years from the United States and from uh, from, you know, from other countries like the EU. Um, you know, it's clear to me that people uh, this is becoming a, a, a bigger issue in terms of just the public consciousness. Do you think it's um, I mean, are you do you feel optimistic about the pol the policy response? Do you do you feel that it's having an impact? Act. Um, you know, what do you see in, in the future as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, in the earlier, we were struggled to, the, you know, show our evidence what we are saying is the mm -hmm. true situation because nobody can go to China and uh, find out what's truly happening there. So it was difficult for all Uyghurs beginning, uh, from the camp beginning to, until maybe two years. Mm -hmm. But we saw right now uh, many, many, you know, uh, the good result come out after uh, we all find out what's happening mm -hmm. behind the wall in Uyghur region, actually. So many... Uh, many of uh, the congressional hearing taking place in this three years. I believe I was the first, um, you know, giving testified about families detained in 2018, uh, June. I give testified in the congressional hearing. After that, like tens of uh, hearing going on. And then after um, we saw uh, some politics change and we see the American government, US government is openly, you know, the, who, who was uh, questioning Chinese government and demanding to stop this uh, the harsh policy toward the uh, Uyghurs and the human rights abuses. And uh, the language using is more, you know, stronger and stronger. And I believe, you know, the right now whole uh, world aware of our situation, Uyghur situation, because the media's uh, reaction also helped a lot. And we saw um, the sanctioning uh, the Chinese uh, officers, uh, the Chinese government who have hands on these issues, uh, these abuses. And we saw the, uh, like two days ago, the, the forced labor bill. Mm. Yes. And then we were Human Rights uh, Act, mm. Policy Act bill passed. All those, uh, you know, uh, very um, make we were uh, hopeful, you know. I can say hopeful, uh, but um, but the reality, uh, you know, n nothing changed uh, in the Uyghur region. They struggled too long and too much. Yeah, I understand. Um, it's a hard thing. To, to recognize, but I think it's something that we all have to sit with. Yeah. Uh, we, we, are, we are very glad, finally, the governments recognized what Chinese propaganda, hmm. different from the reality, you know, 
So we 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 hope soon. So the if they can, you know, access the Uyghur region, it could be bring more, uh, you know, the better result. I I think. Hmm. Uh, but uh, reality, we 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 all um, struggle, even mm. outside or inside. Same, mm. with all our loved ones in Uyghur region. So um, we hope, we hope we cannot lose hope. The only uh, only thing we have is hope. Right now, I can only say that. Yeah, I think I think that's a great place to end this conversation. Um, Gulchehra Hoja, thank you so much for uh, for engaging in this, and thank you for all of your work um, that has made a yeah. remarkable impact. Um, thank you. I just want for... to yeah, I just want to add um, mm. to audience who's watching us. Um, just try to imagine uh, these millions of Uyghur women whose husbands, fathers, and brothers were all sent away to the camps. Mm. Imagine that as a mother, I want to ask you, mm. as a woman, I want to ask you, imagine, just imagine their children that were ripped apart from them. I am asking you, the very least you can do is to never forget. Yep, absolutely. Okay, let's end there. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you very much. Yep, okay.